Making Comics 101, issue 15, Inking. <laughs> Greetings, people of the internet. I'm Scott with CircWorks Art Labs. Welcome, mad creators, to the Underground Laboratory, where together we're going to create some awesome comics because this is Making Comics 101, issue 15. Now, the past two issues that we did were hopefully informative. Hopefully you learned a lot, but we did talk about backgrounds and we talked about perspective. A couple of the things that people try to shy away from because, you know, it's difficult. Uh, so hopefully we've got some of the hard stuff out of the way. We can get back into doing some of the fun stuff because we went from penciling to backgrounds and uh, perspective. And although I enjoy every aspect of creating comics, some people not so much. So I don't know how many people were, were clicking on that. Oh, I'm going to learn perspective or I'm going to learn backgrounds. But it is important. But now we can kind of move on to something super fun. Uh, one of my favorite, if not my favorite part of making comics and that is inking. I just love the process of inking so let's dive into it. We're gonna start with, uh, I like to keep it alliterative so we're gonna start each subcategory. We're gonna start each one off with the T. So the first thing we're gonna talk about starting with the T is tools. So earlier on in this series I did kind of touch on some tools but now I want to talk specifically about some of the tools I use for inking. So I'm gonna show you some of my favorite tools but please keep in mind that you can use whatever tools you want. Of course I'm gonna be showing you some traditional tools. I also do digital inking. For that I use most of my favorite program is Clip Studio Paint. I know some people love to use Procreate some people use Photoshop, whatever the case is. Uh, again, that's up to you. I'm going to show you some of my traditional tools. Now, I tend to prefer using a brush. It's a sable brush. Uh, you can use any, really any brush. I usually go with, I think this is a number one or a number two. I usually stick around there. Uh, sometimes if I'm doing super detailed stuff, I'll go with an aught, which is like a, like a zero, and then you can go down from there to like a triple aught. Super fine hair. Um, now, sometimes these sable brushes, the Winsor Newtons can be a little pricey. I have found them cheaper online. You can pay quite a bit for one of these, but if you want to go with a brush that is a little more economical, uh, but still really good, I would suggest the Cotman watercolor brushes. I use those quite a bit as well. The quill. So the quill is uh, a lot of inkers swear by the quill. I never really mastered it myself. I think uh, I'm going to have to do a demo because I want to show you how each of these tools use in the bonus episode. So I'm going to have to do a little more practice myself as far as the quill. A lot of people do love the quill and you can get super, super fine lines with it or broad lines. I mean, it's pretty versatile. One of the tools that I use more recently, although I do like that traditional brush and like to dip in ink and I'll show you some of the inks that I use. Usually if I'm working on a big comic book project, I still like to use the brush and dip it and everything, but especially for sketches or if I'm doing just kind of a quick comic, I will go with a brush pen. There are all kinds of brush pens out there. This one, I, I'll leave links to all my different tools so you can check it out. This one is a Fude brush pen. It's in Japanese, so I don't really know exactly what, it, what this says, but it's a great pen. I, I get tons of these and I just I go through them like crazy. They are great, especially because they're portable. You can take them anywhere. You don't have to worry about knocking your ink over if you're doing commission sketches or, or whatever the case is. So brush pins are great. There's also Pentel Pocket Brush is good. There's tons of them on the market. This one, I'm not sure which one this is. This is like a zebra brush pen, I think. But there's tons of them. And just try them out. See what works best for you. Something that a lot of uh, illustrators use for inking are micron pens. They come in all different sizes. They are used Usually, you know, they're pretty much one line weight. Uh, we'll talk about different line weights and things like that and different techniques that you can do. But out the box, microns are great for drawing buildings and things like that that require more of a straight line without much line variation. Although, and I will talk, probably talk about this in a quick tip, there is a way to kind of trick these things out so you can get sort of more of a varied line and I will show you that in a quick tip. Now let's say you want to add some detail into your blacks or maybe you're doing stars or something and you would want to go with some white pens. So the, the two that I use are the, the Jelly Roll white pen and a Sino white pen uh, with white ink. These work pretty good. Uh, I haven't found anything that's like blows me away as far as the coverage it gets. Uh, as far as the pens that I've tried, I think these work the best. Now you can even go with, we'll get into some inks and things like that. For your standard black ink, I usually prefer Deleter uh, number, I, I used to use number five, which has a little, it's a little glossier. Number four is flat, so now I've kind of switched over to the number four. I like that flat look a little better, but 
for whatever reason, the the Japanese inks, I, they, they're my favorite. They seem to go on a lot smoother, so they're a little harder to come by. Sometimes you have to wait to get them. They don't always stock them in the U.S., but when you can find them, I would suggest getting some of these. Uh, they work great. Again, links to all this stuff will be in uh, the description. Another ink that, that I've used that has really good coverage is actually, it's not, it, well, it does say India ink, waterproof India ink. The one thing you want to make sure is that whatever ink you use for your comics is that it is waterproof. So this is Dr. P.H. Martin's, it's Black Star. This is like an acrylic ink. It's got really good coverage and uh, I like this. It's a little, it does have a little bit of a glossiness to it, but um, this would be maybe my second choice. And you know, in a pinch, there's always Black Magic or there's some other inks like this. This used to be my favorite favorite and uh, through time the formula has kind of changed so it's not that great but it is readily available and and to be honest anything that you can use to get ink onto a page is gonna work I mean you may have to go over it a couple times if it's if it's not super intense black ink but the goal is just to get ink on the page so whatever you use you can make it work for you now there is something that I would suggest that you stay away from and that is Sharpies. The problem with Sharpies is that they are not light fast, meaning that they will fade over time. Now if your goal is just to get your artwork on a page and then print it and then be done with it, you could use Sharpies then, but if you want to keep your artwork, if you want it to be archival, if you want it to last and not discolor, I would suggest not using Sharpies. In lieu of that, you know, you want something that's going to be quick, something that you can lay some blacks down and spot blacks and everything. So for that, I would suggest the uh, pit pens, fiber, uh, is it fabric Castile? I, don't, I never know how to pronounce that. Uh, I think it's fabric Castile. But anyway, uh, the pit pens, it's got this, this one's got a pretty thick nib on it, about what, a sh what you get with a sharpie but this has got indie ink in it so it will not fade over time maybe hundreds of years it might I don't know but <laughs> for the most part it is it is archival so I would stick with something like this over a sharpie for your white inks uh, again I kind of revert to uh, the deleter inks there is a deleter one and a two I'm not exactly sure the difference I go with the number two I did some research and I forgot the reason why I decided to settle on the two maybe it's thicker I'm not sure deleter white number two is great uh, also PH Martins uh, also makes this proof white uh, it works pretty good or you know if you have to you can go with uh, white out I've seen those white out pens I have not tried them out yet but I'm gonna have to get one and and practice with it because I see some other artists like I've seen Jim Lee use it quite a bit so that's something that I haven't used myself but I'm, I'm wanting to try it out and that's that's kind of the key to all these tools is experimentation get some different tools try them out see what works best for you because what works for me may not work for you and vice versa now there's a lot of other things that we can do different uh, kind of unorthodox tools that we can use for inking and we'll get into some of those towards the end but I think that will serve as our basics for what I think is a good start some things that you need to get for for inking in comics so moving on from tools I want to get into our next keyword and that is technique so I want to talk a little bit about some of the techniques and things that you can use to ink comic books now the primary goal of inking is to get something that's reproducible uh, whereas before if you were to illustrate just in pencil, I mean, it just doesn't have that boldness to it and it doesn't print well. Uh, at least it didn't. Nowadays, uh, our printing processes can do a lot of things. We can, I've seen people that just use pencils and they'll do washes from there or they'll do grayscales, all shading and stuff. You can do comics that way. But traditionally, there, there's a penciler and then the inker goes over the pencils and makes it ready for print and also just adds that impact that you get from that black ink. Those are the kind of comics that I really prefer. So I want to show you an example of the difference uh, of a couple different techniques. One is more of an inking technique. Uh, the other is also inking, but it's more washes. And ironically, these are from the same series. Now, so this is uh, Snowpiercer. Some of you people may have seen the movie. You didn't maybe know that it was based on a comic. But I want to show you. So the first chapter, uh, the first book of Snowpiercer is all pretty much done traditionally. Dark blacks, inks. Again, this is sort of how I prefer more of a traditional traditional ink comic book look. Now, the second book in this series has an entirely different approach. So it's a little jarring at first, 
but you can see this is more done with washes. There aren't a lot of stark, dark ink lines. It, I mean, again, this is probably all done in ink, but you could also get a similar look just by using shading and pencils. So we can do this uh, with, I don't want to say modern printing, but, but really I've seen comics like this even in the past where they were able to get sort of this look. That should give you a basic idea of, of a couple of different techniques. I'm going to focus more on the standard, the traditional inking techniques of creating comics and some of the tools that you would use or some of the techniques that you use rather to achieve some of those looks of shading when in actuality you're just using solid black ink. So the first technique I want to talk about is feathering. So here we can see some examples of feathering. Now as you can see these are all solid lines but they kind of trail away and it gives the illusion of sort of softening your edges and uh, this creates a really good effect and if you do it correctly it will sort of give you that that sense of shading that you would get from pencil with maybe a burnisher to me it that's what says comics is if it doesn't have ink on it it just doesn't feel as much like a comic to me personally now in addition to feathering we also have cross hatching feathering will get you a start but when you start taking feathering and then you kind of cross Hatchet? Yeah, I mean, that's why it's called cross-hatching, right? So here's a great example. This is Bern Hogarth from drawing uh, light and sh uh, dynamic light and shade. But you can, I don't know if you can tell, but if you were to look back here, it looks like this is done, again, with like a pencil, shading a pencil, maybe with a burnisher. But when you get up close, you can see that is all cross-hatch, and it gives that illusion but it's all solid lines and it's just a really cool effect. Beyond feathering and cross hatching, we can also use stippling, which is the technique where you see a lot of little dots. I, I mean, you can concentrate them all in, in one area to get more black or you can kind of fade things out to soften your edges and just use less dots. You've probably seen techniques like that. Probably not as prevalent in comics, but you do see it from time to time in comics, but it is, it is a pretty cool effect and you can achieve that same sort of look. Something we want to be understanding of when we are inking a page is that different objects have different textures to them. You know, if you've got like a hard sort of coarse surface versus something that's smooth, that's going to require you rendering it in ink quite differently. So I'm going to show you this example. Uh, this is uh, Art Adams. This is an Art Adams Frankenstein here. But if you can look at a lot of the different techniques. Now, we don't see anything super shiny in this, but uh, for instance, even things that are similar uh, rocks which are kind of coarse he's got a different technique than he does say in here with this uh, kind of furry coat that he's got grass is a little different all these different sort of materials you're gonna to want to render them a little differently again with the trees and things in the background so even when you're dealing with with more of a rough or coarse shape as opposed to something smooth there's still a lot of variety in there and understanding what techniques to use for certain things. There's some cross hatching in here. There is also some feathering and some of it you can almost say is similar to stippling but with instead of dots with lines. And it's just a matter of experimentation. You can see the result. This is a really cool example of just how different techniques can come together and really pull off an incredible page. So whether you're rendering something like a rock that's going to be sort of chiseled and, and you know it's not going to have a lot of straight lines or something smooth like a piece of metal where you're going to want to probably maybe use a ruler and get some, some real sharp angles on there. You can do all kinds of different techniques. Even objects that aren't solid objects like smoke. Learning how to sort of illustrate that with where it kind of just fades away and has this ethereal look. Those are all things that you can really pull off in the inking stage. And because we're talking about techniques, there are different techniques that you can apply. There's, uh, you can use like a super wet brush for really smooth stuff or if you want to get a, a, a sort of a dried brush maybe it's not the best brush in the world you've got the ink that's on there a little bit it's not quite laying down quite it's kind of breaking up but that's sort of a dry brush technique that you can use and depending on the amount of ink that you use the types of tools that you use to apply them you can get all kinds of really cool effects. Now, before you even put ink to the page, one of the most important things you need to understand is line weight. Now, there are different techniques that are just one solid line, but in most cases, when illustrating comics, you want to have a varied line weight. So what determines where you put down thick lines and thin lines, that has almost everything to do with where your light source is coming from. So typically, say if your light source, in most cases, would probably be coming from the top because that's where the 
sun's coming from. And there are other situations where maybe somebody's up somewhere and there's a light from down below where that can change things around. But most of the time, if I'm just doing something generic, I figure out where my light source is gonna be, say if it's up here off to my right, uh, kind of shining down at an angle. That means anything over here on this side where the light's gonna hit is going to have a lighter line. I'll show you an example here from Art Adams again. You can see up here, see how thin this line is over here where the fist is, where, where the light's coming down, and underneath you've got some thicker lines here. So most of the thicker lines are all going to be on the underside of all of these figures, whereas the lighter side, uh, that's where the light hits. So that's, some, that's one of the ways, even without color, that you can show where your light source is coming from, and it just gives a really dynamic effect when you understand where where your shadows go, where your light source is coming from, where the line should be thicker, where it should be thinner, and that all comes down to where your light source is coming from. Now, the light source isn't the only thing you want to pay attention to when thinking about line weight and when laying down your inks. The other thing is creating contoured lines, and that can also be, in addition to where your light's coming from, it can be from foreground to background. And this is sort of an atmospheric uh, perspective technique. Here is, again, I'm showing all the, I mean, Art Adams is my favorite artist, so I'm just gonna keep showing you some examples. He used a different technique on this, and this, he's using his different, con he's using contours in his lines. You can see, it's relatively outside of this figure it's all pretty much this bold line whereas the interior lines get thinner it's not as natural as say you might do with line weight and there's some of that too for the most part you've got this bold thing but that's gonna pop this character out from these other characters and most characters in here have that same thing where the outer line is thicker and then the interior line is a little thinner and that's just a technique that we can get things to kind of separate from the background, pop things, things are more in the foreground, have a thicker line versus things that are off in the distance. Line weight isn't the only thing we have to be aware of when inking our page. We also have to pay attention to our shadows and how we spot our blacks or lay our blacks down on the page and making sure that it makes sense that it's even, that there's, you know, there's a good balance there. And the amount of blacks that you've placed down on a page is really, it's, it's kind of up to your own taste. For for instance, these are some pages that I did for uh, the 100 Days of Making Comics Anthology. And on this particular project, I use a lot more blacks than I would on, say, my comic book, Young and the Dead which doesn't have a lot, it's, it's a lot more line weight. Different projects may require different things. And again, it's all up to your taste. Uh, we can kind of see Jack Kirby, here's, here's a Jack Kirby page, a lot of blacks in here, using a lot of feathering techniques. Here is, uh, this is Bill Sankevich, and, and this is an awesome page. If you notice, there is very little line weight on any of this. I mean, you don't even see any line weight around this Moon Knight character. You see, you know, you see the rain coming down. Now, he could have easily outlined this character and it would have still looked pretty well, but just the absence of those lines, uh, and just concentrating more on how he spots his blacks and, and the rain creating the outline itself. There's all kinds of awesome techniques that you can do with that. I mean, he really pulled off a masterpiece on this page as far as I'm concerned. So just be aware, you can strip away all the lines, focus on blacks, or you can go mostly just line weight. And it's just, again, this is all your taste and how you approach it as an artist. Here's another page by Jack Kirby, and this is almost, look at, there's very little lines in this. This too, it's almost all solid blacks, really bold lines. Uh, maybe, it, you know, and I'm a, I'm a fan of Jack Kirby, but this one might be a little too black for my taste, but you know, who knows, once you add the color and everything, yeah, this is, this could create a really, really powerful page just because of the amount of blacks on it. It would be hard for me to explain exactly where you place your blacks, and that's why when you hear the term spotting blacks, it's difficult to say what works best. It's something that you get a lot from practice, but you can see here, here are some different uh, panels. This is from How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. But here you see with the line weight, but when you strip away those lines, you can see where the blacks are and the composition and Again, you see that over here, but you can kind of see when, when you start separating these elements, what it really means to how to lay your blacks down and how, how much uh, it adds to your, your panels. Here is a really good example from somebody who kind of falls on the side of mostly line weight, not a lot of blacks. This is Sean Galloway. Now, this is some, some of his process stuff. Now, you can see the stuff that's sort of this purplish gray. 
This isn't actually blacks in the comic, it's his shadows, but you can see how if you were going to go with just a solid black and white, how well this looks. And you know, typically, like I said, mostly his illustrations are all very much concentrated on really tight line work. You can see how even before he goes into color, he puts, he drops, starts dropping in his grays. And let me see if I have examples. You can see right here, there's not a lot of solid blacks, but he uses basically where, where you could be putting down solid blacks, he used that as a shade. I'm not showing the same exact page, but I think you get the gist. But also in this example, we can see how shadows cast. You can see where the light source is coming from over here and how the shadows cast over here. You see it underneath and how it's kind of going off here in the distance. And also, you under, if you understand the texture of things, you also understand how shadows lay down. For instance, if you are on sort of a flat surface, like a concrete, your shadow is going to kind of go off and trail, depending on where the sun is. In contrast, if you are standing on like a slick, tiled surface, Usually, your shadow is going to kind of go straight down as a reflection almost. Look at the way different shadows are cast on different materials uh, or at different times of day. Depending on the type of day, a shadow is going to have a longer trail. Sometimes it's just going to be sort of a little spot under you. Sometimes it's going to trail further off. So be conscious of that when you're starting to lay down your shadows. There are all kinds of really cool techniques that you can accomplish through the inking stages. For instance, for action, create speed lines. You see a lot of this in in manga here's here's an example I showed this before this is Sean Tiffany's oil can drive but I want to show you so uh, he uses a number of techniques on just even this one page whereas here you've got the speed lines look here we've got sort of a splatter effect that you can get maybe from like a toothbrush that, that I will show you how to do here we've got some zip -a -tone, but he's just take again zip -a -tone over here there's so many different approaches that you can use to pull off these different techniques. We've got some, looks like some white spatter, zip -a tone speed lines, it, it's just, it again, splatter, everything right here in one page. So don't be afraid, don't just stick to just one technique, switch them up, use all kinds of techniques and you get some just awesome effects. I mean, it, that's that's what's so great about inking is it just, it's, it's all about experimentation, trying different things out, see what works. Having said that, let's talk about some tricks that you can use in your comic book inking. So I talked about a splatter effect uh, and you can accomplish that with like a toothbrush where you will put the ink on your brush and just kind of flick it and you'll get a little bit of that. You can also use white ink and get some stars. Really great for creating stars and maybe go it. You can also then go back in to create more defined stars with your jelly pen and try different things out. You can use Q-tips to create a curvy crackle effect. Just dip a Q-tip in and depending on the amount of pressure you apply, you can get that really quick curvy crackle look to your comics obviously Kirby crackle popularized by Jack Kirby you can use sponges I find it works better with like a thicker ink like an acrylic and just kind of do that you can get like some rough edges for rocks and things like that but when you are doing some of these more messy techniques one of the things you might want to do is you want to mask off your page you can either cut out of paper make a mask or you can get like a liquid mask like this all you basically you just paint it down like you would anything else you cover what you don't want your ink to hit and then do your techniques and then it just peels right off. I've used splatter techniques where you can take like a credit card and then uh, a quill and just kind of go like that and flick little, get sort of like blood spatter. The possibilities and the things that you can do with different ink inking techniques is just, it's, it's unlimited. So you've got to just experiment, try different things out. Now, like I said, some of this stuff can get a little messy. The other thing you want to be careful of is smudging. Every inker has that situation where it's like, oh, I, I smudged it. And luckily, most things can be fixed going back in with a little whiteout. Or if it's super drastic, you can even cut out whatever shape you need and then spray mount it onto the page to kind of and then go over it and color it if you get something really bad but to, in order to avoid some of these mistakes there's some things you can do you can wear a glove like I use the same glove that I it's like a smudge protector that I use on my Cintiq so that I don't get smudges all over the place I will also use that for for inking sort of like I, they sell like white cotton gloves that you can also use the other thing that I did was I, I created sort of a bridge with a ruler so as you can see I kind of raised this up here so that when I'm drawing my hand is kind of raised over my page and I kind of kind of move it up and down 
so that I'm not worrying about smudging my page and my hand isn't actually touching the page. The more you practice, the more you'll get an idea on dry time. Most ink dries fairly quickly, but there are always those cases, especially if you're spotting blacks, those larger areas will take longer to dry, so you have to be careful. And a lot of times you don't even need, especially now that we have you know digital techniques, even if you're illustrating traditionally, sometimes you'll just not worry about filling in those big black spaces, and what you can do from that is just like the X marks the spot technique where you just put a little X, especially if you're working with somebody else. If you are a penciler only and you're passing that on to an inker, instead of going through all that in a pencil, you can just put the little X and that will let your inker know that it's supposed to be filled in with black. It just saves some time and the inker can either fill that in or uh, in the digital stage. And you know, I you might want to fill that all in, in black because that's gonna make your finished page if you are selling them look a little better if it's complete. But sometimes people like those little things. They like to see those X's or they like to see the white out of the page. They wanna see all that because that's what's, what shows the stuff that you can't see when you're looking at a printed piece of black and white art or even color art. But when you see those actual pages and you see what makes those pages, you can see all these techniques in play and you can see, oh man, I wonder if you use this technique or that technique. Yeah, there's just tons of stuff you can do. But, but what I was getting to is that you could not fill in any of those blacks. Even if you're working traditional, you could bring it into the computer and just drop, you know, take that paint bucket tool and drop that in and fill that in as well. And of course, if you're working full digitally, it's so easy to spot those blacks and you don't have to worry about all this mess. But sometimes that playing around in those, that's what makes it so fun to traditionally ink. It's so tactile and I really do enjoy that. And even though now that I'm doing more digital inking, I, I miss that a lot. So every once in a while or quite often, I still want to go back to uh, actually inking with actual tools. I just love that process and there's so many different techniques and tricks and tips and things that you can do. Um, so I'm curious if, if you guys have your own tips or techniques, something that I didn't mention here, and there's tons of them. Let me know in the comment section. I'm really curious how different people approach inking your own inside secrets. I'm not really crazy about trade secrets, so let that stuff out. Tell people about it. That's the whole reason why I'm doing this series is to help educate people and, and giving away all my tricks and things that I've learned along the way so you don't have to just stumble upon them by yourself. But maybe you do stumble upon them and experimentation is again that's that's the fun of traditionally inking and trying all these things out so let me know some of the techniques you guys use and that's going to do it for this issue of making comics 101 talking about inking and i will see you guys later that is all hey thanks for watching if you like what you saw and you want to see more hit that subscribe button also you can follow me at surfworks on social media and now you can support the work that i do on patreon do you like making comics then go to surfworks.com and pick up the comic maker starter kit it's packed full of fonts brushes templates and more and best of all it's totally free